Okay. So this is lecture 19 of ECE 503. So in today's lecture, what we're going to be talking about are the implementation of discrete time systems. So we're kind of going to revisit what we looked at several lectures ago in terms of um, things like direct form 1 and direct form 2 uh, filter implementations with delays, adders, multipliers. But we're then going to build upon that and look at a few other types of implementations that folks have used. Some of them are kind of useful, like for instance, like comb filters and, and the like, which you can implement using um, uh, some variations of, let's say, these direct form ones and twos. But uh, at the end, and what takes up about half of this lecture, which I think I'm going to jump into um, first, is this idea of lattice filters. So what do I mean? Okay. So this is where I start jumping. So we, we've seen so far, like, you know, if we had an FIR filter, right, fur filter. That, that's what folks in the community say. So we've seen several types of implementations, right? So we've seen fur filters that do the following. So let's say we have an input x of n. And then we take some guy, right? Let's say we multiply him with some sort of coefficient, a0. Then let's say we take another guy, delay him. Perhaps we multiply him by a coefficient, a1. And then progressively do the same thing over and over again. Delay, multiply, a2 add, and so on, and so on, and so on, with all these other delay and multiply blocks, right? A2, A3, A4, Z minus 1, Z minus 2. Actually, no, no one caught me. Let me try again. Yeah, because they're all going to be z to the minus 1. In case I have a senior moment, you guys should be speaking up, right? OK, so let me try it again. The z's should be like this. Yeah. OK. And then you have x of n. So you have the first guy. Then here's your, your multiply with a coefficient, c1. And then they're added together. Then you have c2. Then you add it with those guys. Then you have c3. Then you add, and so on, right? c4, add, c5, add. And then you get your output y of n. And we saw that we can also do, um, in case, so that's FIR. We also have seen, in the case of IR realizations, we had things like direct form 1 and direct form 2. And direct form 1 and 2, how did it look like? Well, we knew that direct form 2 was more hardware efficient, right? We basically have these delay elements. We had y of n at this end. We had x of n at that end, correct? And what ended up happening is we send the data or the signal up. It would get multiplied by some sort of coefficient. Okay, and same thing here. Okay, multiply with a coefficient, multiply with a coefficient, multiply with a coefficient, multiply with a coefficient, right? And add and so on. And we also saw the equivalent from this perspective, right? The direct form one, which was a little bit more hardware inefficient. And 
there's a multiply, multiply, multiply. And then at this end, So we're multiplying, we're multiplying, and so on and so forth. So, okay, so so far so good. We saw how we can represent these guys, especially when we find out what the transfer function, if it's a considered irrational, right? So what we've seen in the, uh, before is that if we can get a transfer function, h of z, and it's equal to y of z over x of z, right? And this turns out to be, b0 plus b1 z to the minus 1 plus b2 z to the minus 2 and so on divided by a0 plus a1 z to the minus 1 plus a2 z to the minus 2 so on and so forth what happens is if we have this rational representation we have a polynomial of some order of z's delays in the numerator and another polynomial consisting of z's to some power n, some order m. What we can do is we can represent it in df1, df2. If it's just an FIR, we just get the simple, what we, this guy here, there's a name for this. We call it a tap delay line. Tap delay line. Okay? And we'll say, okay, that's it. That looks good. I'm happy. No. There's actually other things we can do. Okay? So what happens is we can implement other ways of doing FIR and IR filtering. Okay? What happens is there's a few other types of filters. For instance, what we can do is we can break up some of these filters into a cascade of, let's say, a, some sort of subfilter, if you will, and the cascade overall is equal to this entire filter for whatever reason. For instance, in the next lecture, we'll talk about IR filters, and we can break them up into what they call second-order sections, right? So we basically have a filter, an IR filter, that's at most order two, and we have order 2 filter, order 2 filter, order 2 filter, strung together to e equal something that's much higher order. Right? But the one filter I would like to talk about, okay? The one filter I would like to talk about is the lattice filter. So the lattice filter, as we'll see, it will look something like this. You have x of n. It goes through this box. It goes through this box. It goes through this box. And you might say, what's in the box? I'll get to it. And then this guy is y. And inside the box, What it's going to be, it's going to look like this. Mm, yes. It's going to look like that. Add. Add. And it goes out. And goes out. And uh, you have something called a reflection coefficient. So you multiply both paths by kn if this is the nth stage. So if this is nth stage. So this, I believe, is... Hmm. Yeah, bad, bad choice. I should not be using n. M. <laughs> this is the nth stage. And so this guy... Hmm. No. There it's n. And then that's g of m minus 1 n. And then this will give you now m n, and this will give you g m n. 
And so what happens is you can actually produce a filter that all it consists of is a cascade of these lattices, these single, these sections. If you cascade them, we call this a lattice filter. And what we'll show later in this lecture, which is actually half the lecture, starting at slide 8 all the way until slide 15, it's all about lattice structures. And the problem is they're kind of difficult to get your mind around. But the simple premise is about figuring out how a filter works, right? So, so let's say we take an FIR filter. So we're not going to talk about, like, lattice filters by themselves, those are FIR only. There's also something called a lattice ladder filter. That is IR. So we'll talk about that in the next lecture. We'll talk about it in lecture 20. But lattice filters are FIR filters. And you might say, how in the world can this produce an FIR filter? I don't see anything that looks FIR about this. Here's the answer. There has to be an answer. So let's say we take x of n. Okay. And so let we progressively, only the bottom branch has the delay elements, right? So let's say we do three sections. And the output at the last section, let's say that's y of n. All right? And then we take this guy, the output of the delayed element, and that should be an adder there. And then we take this guy, the bottom branch, and there should be an adder there. And we just repeat. We do this. And then finally, this guy here. And so let's say this first stage, our reflection coefficients k1. K2, just like the mountain, and K3. Okay. So what we're interested in, what we know is, let's say if we had an FIR filter. What is an FIR filter? What is the tap delay line? So let's, let's take an aside. Aside. So what is YN? Let's say this is three stages, right? Y of n. Theoretically, if this is FIR, what should we have? We should have, let's say, x of n. We should also have some coefficient, a, no, let's not use a, let's use b. b1, x, n minus 1, correct? So it's the first guy in the past times a coefficient plus b2, xn minus 2, right? That's the second element from the past. I'm actually looking into memory. And then last but not least, b3, xn minus 3. So remember, again, the tap delay line, I'll draw it cro correctly this time. You've got this, you've got this, you've got this. And... We add, we add, we add, and that produces y of n, that is x of n, and then you have your coefficient here. So that guy is going to be b1, this guy here the coefficient is b2, this guy the coefficient is b3, right? So what the lattice does is a little bit different. So what this guy will do, so let's say we take the first guy, this sec section here. Yeah. And then we'll go and see him. And then we'll look at the last guy. So this guy, what do we have? So what's the top branch? What is he equal to? So let's say the top branch there. 
So suppose we call him f1 of n. And let's say this bottom guy at this point here is g1 of n. What's f1 of n equal to? He's going to be equal to x of n, k1, xn minus 1. Is that right? Does everyone get that? The bottom branch, g1 of n, what is he equal to? He is going to be equal to x n minus 1 plus k1 x of n, right? So what happens is the f1 is going to be the top branch, and he goes straight to f1, and then the bottom branch delays x of n. That's why we have x of n minus 1, and then it goes through this crossover, this part of the lattice, multiplied by k1 to give you the f1 of n and the g1 of n. Let's repeat. So this guy here, this sec section, let's, let's actually not look at just the section. Let's look at everything up to that point, just for fun. So what is, at this point, f2 of n and g2 of n equal to? So f2 of n is going to be equal to x of n. Then what we're going to get is we're going to get this contribution here, right? So we're going to get k1. Ah, x n minus 1, right? So we're going to have this guy. Now, here's kind of an interesting situation. I can also get, let's say, this path. Delay by twice and come out that way. So I can get k2, x n minus 2. Mm, but wait, there's more. What I can also do is I can get this guy and come back up. So what I can do is I can get k1, delay by 1, and then k2. So k1, k2, xn minus 1. So what I basically am showing is that there's at least 1, 2, 3, there's like four distinct contributions that are adding to the f minus, uh, f1, uh, sorry, f2 of n term at that output. And you might say, okay, so what? So what? Well, right now this doesn't look like the tap delay line, but it actually is. Let, let me rewrite this. This will be equal to, let's group all these xn terms and x minus 1, n minus 1 terms together, and what we get is this. Notice that here are my delayed elements, and now I am basically getting coefficients all in terms of the ki's, right? So instead of b1, b2, b3, b4, b5, b6, now I have something all in terms of different um, reflection coefficients at different points within the lattice. And I can keep on doing this. In fact, the process for determining what are the A's, uh, sorry, the B, B1s, B2s, B3s, B4s from all the reflection coefficients? It's a little bit tedious, but, but in essence, you can really, like through that process, you can actually extract what these, um, these coefficients are all in terms of Ks. All right? So I, the reason why I'm doing this first before we jump into the entire, the rest of the lecture is because when I usually hit this, this particular implementation, people start yawning. Not like anyone's not doing that now, but people really start yawning. So just a heads up, like when we start doing lattices, this is the premise. What happens is we have an FIR filter that we're constructing as a lattice, and it's a nice structure as well. 
you know, in terms of, um, you know, how we have, you know, the delay elements at the bottom, we have those uh, reflection coefficients, um, and, and, and everything just propagates very nicely across the entire uh, lattice structure. All right. So let's, let's get to it. Let's actually jump into lecture 19. Okay. So we saw the LCCDE, right? The linear constant coefficient difference equations. And this is actually the premise for all things FIR and IIR, right? So we saw this guy. And if we take the Z transform, we get this, this, this expression. This is a rational... This is a rational representation of our transfer function that consists of a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator in terms of z's, right? And we saw how we can get direct form 1, direct form 2. We saw how we can get the, um, these tap delay line realizations, right? And what ends up happening is that we can also, and this we did not talk about, and so this is the... We, we can also do something in terms of cascaded structures, right? So what we can do is that we can break up something like this H of Z, which we will do in lecture 20. Or in terms of the FIR filter, what we can do is we can break up these individual or groupings of delay line elements into some sort of basic subset of functions. So let's say we take this second order tap delay line element, and if we cascade them all together, we can get a tap delay line filter that's much greater in order than, let's say, the individual two, order two tap delay line element. And so we can do things like that. So this thing is called a cascade form structure. And this is the other thing. So the the two filter structures we did not talk about are cascade, which essentially means that instead of, let's say, representing or just using a filter that is all H of Z, let's say it has a system function, so this is your overall system function, what we can instead do What we can instead do is just have these mini transfer functions. Okay? And what we can do is this is equivalent to this. By essentially, you know, when we have multiple systems together, what do we do? When we cascade them, we're multiplying the transfer functions together. Okay. So that's one approach. And then the other approach is something called frequency sampling structures, where what we do is we actually design the filter in the frequency domain rather than the time domain. So what we can do instead is we can select how we want our filter to actually sample rather than in the time in the frequency domain rather than time domain. And again, this is this has its benefits in a, several applications, but I'll show you how to construct one. So just like what we did with DFTs, we can make our frequency like our frequency sampling structure look like the following. So instead of having our DTFT what we instead do is we define omega as these specific sampling instances. In this case, what we do is we sample every 2 pi k divided by n, if we have a total of n points we want to sample across frequency. But we also have this alpha term as well, and this is some sort of offset, if you will. Do we want to sample here, or do we want to sample alpha next to it? And that alpha can either be set to 0 or to a half. And so what happens is, let's say if we apply it to our expression for the DTFT here, what we end up getting, if we solve for everything, and what we end up getting, and then we take the inverse operation, which kind of looks like a DFT, 
we get this weird looking structure, which if we then take its Z transform, we end up getting something that looks like a comb filter. So what a comb filter does, just like your comb for hair, is that it just selects a subset of frequencies and discards the rest, right? So the comb filter, um, the way it works is it, it basically selects these frequencies and discards the rest. And, and the same thing also happens with, let's say, how do you represent that in the uh, pole zero domain? It looks like a, essentially a collection of zeros or poles that are evenly distributed around the azimuth of the Z plane. And the way you would implement it would be a structure that looks like this, where you have the comb, and then you have a bunch of single pole filters in, in tandem with it. Okay. So again, comb filters are used a lot in practice, um, especially when you have the known presence of, let's say, one or more signals that are evenly spaced out then that's a perfect structure to deal with, right? Uh, now here's the lattice I was telling you about. So we've seen this, and again, these lattice structures can be built up all, like, you know, M stages, N stages, any number of stages that you want, and this would easily implement an FIR filter. And then the description that we talked about, so Slide 9 kind of builds upon uh, what we just talked about, especially this expression here in the box below. So what this guy here is representing is this is actually your tap delay line, right? So this x of n, this is what passes through, and then your alpha m of k, this is what I was telling you guys about in terms of uh, your filter coefficients, right? And then multiplied against... Um, each delayed element of a various amount of delay uh, uh, of x of n. So, so what ends up happening is really, let's get to the punchline, is this guy here. So it actually is exactly uh, f2 of n. So what ends up happening is when you work this out, right, so you have this x, and you do all these paths between x of n and the output here of f2 of n, which is equal to y of n, what you've got, essentially, are all these coefficients multiplied with each other, but otherwise, this guy here would be your b1. This guy here would your, be your b2, if that is the limit of your lattice structure. If your lattice goes to a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh stage, you would have to work this out in its entirety in order to get the final A, uh, sorry, the B1, B2, B3, B4 uh, coefficient. Now, how do you get, let's say, these B1s, B2s, B3s, or it, uh, conversely, how do you get the, these coefficients, these K1s, K2, K3? How do you interchange between one domain and the other? And the answer is there are a variety of different expressions. So the one I drew in the box here is, is the first approach in, in getting, that, getting those coefficients. So the first thing is the box here kind of describes how your information, your signals are processed from the previous stage to the current stage and then to the next stage, right? So it tells you how your fm minus 1 of n and your gm minus 1 of n minus 1, how all of those are handled with respect to each lattice stage. And then what ends up happening is you proceed to actually calculate what this AM. And AM essentially is your, uh, the, the, the representation of your alpha M. Those are your filtering coefficients for your FIR filter. And so through this, you can actually, like here, we actually talk about forward predictor. The reason why we call it a, a forward predictor is by, based on the fact that we have this sort of expression, this lit, like, well, let me go a few slides back. This guy here. So it almost looks like we're trying to predict y of n given all these past values. So n minus 1, n minus 2, all the way to n minus m. 
And then here's our current value. And from those past values and the current value, we're trying to find out, OK, here's y of n. So that's why we call this guy here the forward predictor. Okay. As for the bottom branch, uh, the bottom branch, again, is the one thing you want to pay attention to. And even when I did it, do I still have it on the PowerPoint, or did I delete it? Oh, shoot, I deleted it. What happens is, remember how when we did the calculation, we did the evaluation. Uh, do I have it somewhere? Nah. What ends up happening, so here's g of 2 of n. Notice that these coefficients are actually in reverse. So the b2 is actually on the non-delayed x. And then b1 is on xn minus 1, which is fine. And then there's no coefficient on xn minus 2. It does the exact opposite on the lower branch as opposed to the upper branch. Okay? So which is kind of like, huh? What? So, it, so the upper branch we call the forward predictor, right? And what we call the bottom branch and those coefficients, we call them beta. So alpha are all those equivalent coefficients that form essentially our tap delay line from x of n to y of n. We call that the forward predictor because it has this form that looks like this. It looks like a prediction process, right? Between the input and the output looking at past histories. And then the bottom branch looks like it's topsy-turvy. It actually is doing everything in reverse. And so we call that guy, and those coefficients, the betas, we call it the backward predictor. <coughs> okay. And then you have a series of like through the mathematical rigor, what we can do is, if we can represent these guys in terms of their z-transform, it turns out that we can find out what the am of z and bm of z is, knowing what the kms are, and looking at the previous am, the am minus 1 of z and the bm minus 1 of z with a delay element. We can actually, this is the expression for finding the next am and bm from the past, uh, the previous AM and BM, using KM. All right. So, okay. So, what did we cover? So, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, the DF1, the DF2 structures. Looking at the LCCDE, right, the linear constant coefficient difference equations, we can create using delay elements, using multiplies, using adds. We can create a variety of different systems, right? both IR, which we'll talk about more in the next lecture, and FIR, which we talked a lot about in this lecture. We talked about, in particular, like uh, the um, uh, tap delay line realization. We also looked at uh, cascading, let's say, smaller order, like you know, lower order segments together. So we can create an FIR filter or FIR system using subsystems that are also FIR strung together in series. At the same time, we also looked at um, uh, different types of, um, um, what the heck was it called? Frequency sampling realizations. And very importantly, and lastly, and I think this is the thing that I think will require a little bit more reading. Okay? So definitely check out um, example 9.2.2 in your textbook, because this will help you get a little bit more familiar with these lattice structures. We looked at how lattices came about? Like, how, how, do you, how do you make a lattice? Where did KM come from? What, why do, like, you know, how is that structure, how is the lattice structure similar to a delayed tap line, right? And so we explored it a little bit and, and how, how that is realized. A lot of the math here is just sort of like, um, sort of goes through the rigor of saying, okay, if you have this, this is how you get to the next stage. But if you know how conceptually all of this works, it should actually, you could do this from scratch. All right? So in, so in this, this lecture, we saw these implementations. In the next lecture, we'll be looking at the IIR realizations. Okay? So with that, that is lecture 19. All right. Yeah. Let's just say I'm also not a...